But I now I guess I would like to thank Dave again and give the floor to Kurt Gibble, who already has been announced by Dave, right? And uh, he was a postdoc at the time at Steve's group. And uh, as it was mentioned, technologies are important. The one thing I have in my memory concerning Kurt's contribution to technology is he's the guy who actually brought diode laser technology, right, to the true group. And a lot of other very nice things there. Okay, Kurt. Uh, thank you very much, Akam. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you. So let me, I would, I'd like to talk about a couple of things, a couple of reminiscences. Uh, first, uh, uh, well, let me say that, that my title is Atomic Clocks Chew Style. And so I hope to uh, convey, as some of the earlier speakers did, uh, the approach that we took to things uh, at that time, that very fruitful era in Steve's lab. Uh, first, the phone interview. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then uh, traveling with Steve. It's a very relaxed uh, passenger. And then tell you a little bit about our uh, cesium fountain clock and, and really a story of making clocks better and also understanding the collisions of the cesium interactions and uh, maybe some other things after that, we'll see how far we get. So uh, along the way, a lot of people contributed and helped us out. Uh, at Stanford, grad student Steve Kasapi at the beginning, and then Occam Peters uh, worked with me on the fountain at the end. And then uh, guys from Hewlett Packard and JPL and uh, other clock companies, and then at Penn State and Yale, a number of students have contributed. And throughout the entire time, uh, Boudinder Har and his group really contributed contributed a lot to on the theory side of things. So I, let me, we've, a couple of people have already mentioned, in case you didn't know, that Steve is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to money, um, Steve makes decisions. Uh, he makes, in fact, he makes all of his decisions. Uh, would, you, you know, would you say that Steve makes really rational decisions or makes decisions from his gut. And uh, now there's some other people we know for the last seven and a half years or so who make decisions from his gut. And to Steve's credit, he listens to the other arguments and then makes a good decision from his gut. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> The, uh, the first, my first exposure to Steve was, uh, of course, uh, being hired as a postdoc when he called me up and interviewed me on the phone. And he gives me the usual uh, standard interview questions that uh, people said, oh, that's, that's what you expect from somebody from Bell. And, uh, but, but the point that I want to make here is that, that while Steve is cheap, he's also principled, and he has principles about money. And most of you have seen through the years that you thought that the principle about money was just that he's cheap. And there's more to it than that. So when he was interviewing me, uh, so then we got down to the point and he basically said, well, I've, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure I want to hire you, uh, but I want to sleep on it. And so that goes back to this making a decision from your gut. Uh, now, I don't know what kind of guy would tell you basically I want to hire you and then call you back the next day and say, ah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> But then we got to salary. And uh, so Steve said, you know, uh, when I was a grad student at Berkeley, and then I went to Bell, my salary doubled. And then when I went from Bell to, uh, to I'm sorry, to a postdoc, sorry, it was grad student postdoc, uh, my salary doubled. And then I went from postdoc to, to Bell, my salary doubled again. And this was a very important principle to Steve. And so he, so he said, you know, uh, so I'm thinking of offering my, my standard salary right now for a postdoc. I think it was maybe twenty-one or twenty-two thousand dollars. I forget what the number was. I think that's about what it was. You, I probably remember the conversation better than you. <clears throat> so Steve said, "What's your salary at, at Colorado?" So I was at Jill at the time, and I said, uh, "Oh, we make fifteen five. Jeez. <laughs> Are you serious? I can't do that. <laughs> really? 
Well, maybe I can, maybe I can go to 23. <laughs> Does Carl pay his students that much? <laughs> Jeez! <laughs> really? 15.5? I can't do that much. How about, I'll go 24 and a half. <laughs> I just kept sitting there silently. <laughs> so, so, so he's not just cheap. He does have some principles about money. And uh, anyway, I, uh, I appreciated the raise, and, and uh, it, it's a, a good negotiating tactic with Steve. So uh, around the end of 91, so I came in uh, at the beginning of 91, I believe it was, and, uh, and we did the monster mott, so uh, doing a vapor cell trap, uh, like what Carl did with cheap little diode lasers where he got a little itty bitty trap, and we took a big tie sap and made a really big trap. And so uh, uh, that became known, as, I think it was Bill's group who called it the monster mott. And, uh, and near the end of 91, then we were looking to go into atomic clocks, and so Steve was invited to give a talk at uh, the PTTI meeting, Precise Time and Time Interval meeting, which was down at LAX. And uh, Luke Malecki, who was, uh, plays in a role, role in many of these meetings, and uh, his lab was one of the hosts. Uh, he was the head of the time and frequency group uh, out at JPL. And so we wanted to uh, take a, a trip out and see what he was doing. You know, LAX up to Pasadena, it's not so far. Gene, uh, around that time, as I remember, you had a sports car. And I think it was a Nissan 380ZX. Yeah, bright red, it was very nice, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you and Steve would go out and you'd be driving, would you describe him as a calm and trusting passenger? Oh, I never drove my car with him. <laughs> So, so Lutz really quite a good driver, and he at the time had a had a, a great, a beautiful, a beautifully maintained. Uh, I think it was an '84 BMW 633 CSI, and you know he was a good driver, and and we didn't want to take a whole lot of time away from the conference, so we drove from LAX up to up to Pasadena. Do you remember the ride? So uh, you know, Lutz says in his defense that he was not going that fast. Uh, he never has averaged over 85 miles an hour on the Pasadena freeway. I was sitting in the, so, so Lute was driving, Steve was riding shotgun. Uh, I was in the back seat and Steve could stop the other and I would occasionally peer over the, the Lute's shoulder and see the, the speedometer and I thought we were in a 35 mile zone, we might have been going 70 or so. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I remember most is Steve sitting in the front seat with his hands on the dash, saying, <laughs> so that was, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, we played around a little bit with trying to do a, a clock, and then, then we wanted to get really fairly serious. And uh, for reasons I'll tell you in a little bit, I remember the date very clearly, uh, July 15th, 92. We had talked about a little bit the day before, and then we had a, a meeting. Steve and I were going to talk about a strategy on how to build a fountain clock uh, the next day. At that point, so I said, we had the monster mutt, so we had this part of the apparatus, which was a big trap. And uh, so, you know, sat down with Steve in his office, and, and Steve said, okay, what do we have to do? Like, well, we, one thing we have to do is we have to rotate the apparatus to, to that direction. And then we have to do a launch, launch the atoms. That, that part's straightforward. And then the harder part is, Steve said, well, we've got to make a microwave cavity and a magnetic shielding to put above the, the fountain clock. And so, you know, how are we going to go about doing that? And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about it. Hewlett Packard Labs are, is right down the road. Why don't we get a Hewlett Packard clock and bolt it right on top of our fountain? And Steve immediately said, yeah, let's do that. Do you want to call Len Cutler or should I? I said, you know, I knew I'd be looking for a job in a little bit, so I said, ah, I'll call him. And so I called Len that afternoon, and Len was, really, was a re really remarkable person. Uh, you know, imagine Len sitting in his, in his cubicle one afternoon, and he gets a phone call from this guy, says, you know, I'm postdoc at Stanford. 
we want to put a, one of your clocks on top of our laser-cooled atoms. And Len's reaction wasn't, you know, uh, well, geez, what paperwork am I going to have to do to do that? What, what uh, you know, what are the problems here? Should we do this? Should we be involved in this? His reaction immediately was, which one of our clocks should I give you? And so in a couple of minutes, you know, we went over things, and he was just sitting there saying, you know, how can I help? And he had gone through all the things in his head, as far as I can tell, in just a few minutes and said, yeah, uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, I should have it all ready. I'll give you a call. Come on down and pick it up. I realize I forgot a bad story in the, at the beginning now. I got to go back. I'm sorry. So remember that thing about the phone interview? He said, I think I, think I want to hire you, uh, but let me sleep on it. So. The next day goes by, he doesn't call back. <laughs> Turns out uh, Steve was sick that day. And so the second day afterwards, where's Carl? Carl's back there. Carl's walking down the hall in Jill and says, oh, yeah, uh, Steve said he feels like a total jerk and he wants to hire you. Don't worry, he'll give you a call. And I'm not sure if, if you actually said you feel like a total jerk or if <laughs> Carl added that part. But anyway, that's what I got. So again, uh, so Len said he's going to call me back the next day to give me the clock, and uh, no phone call. So he too had food poisoning or something that day. In any event, on Friday, uh, he gave me a call back the, net, the following day and go down to, to Hewlett Packard Labs and pick up the clock, bring it back to Stanford, go down to the machine shop, cut the thing open. Uh, if you've never gone in, you know, we build these physics apparatuses, eh, they work. They don't look great in the end, but uh, you take apart a properly engineered instrument, they're truly amazing inside, really beautiful. And what they did at, at HP was, was a really marvelous instrument. So this worked great. So we, we took, the, took the clock apart, and then you know the guys at HP were just so great. They were so wonderful. Uh, we got it apart, figured out how to put it on, designed everything. So that was July, something like July uh, 17th, I think we got the clock. Uh, from HP, uh, designed a vacuum chamber to hold it, and then took this apart, and then we're going to put it back together. And uh, Len assigned Lou Miller to uh, sort of see this through. And Lou's from HP Santa Clara. Jack Custers was the manager uh, at HP Santa Clara. And uh, basically, Lou, at one point, Lou said, we're going to put it back together about getting to put it in. And Lou said, you know, we put together a lot of the, a lot more th of these things than you have. So why don't we just put it back together for you? And so they put this thing back together. We dropped it in, and then essentially this thing worked the first time. Uh, Lute Malecki from the previous slide uh, lent us a maser, shipped a maser up to Stanford, and then uh, you know Len immediately realized that his their electronics at HP won't help us that much. It won't be the easiest easy for us to use to generate the 9.2 gigahertz to drive this cavity. And so uh, he, was, he knew the competitor's instrument very well. He did a little consulting for them. And uh, we, we got the uh, uh, microwave synthesizer from their competitor, uh, Frequency and Time Systems, now Symmetricom, Don Emmons and uh, Mike Garvey. And so uh, two months later, this thing was running with Ramsey fridges. It was really remarkable. Uh, after that, so. What we wanted to see was uh, Verhar at that point, uh, 91, mid-91, and it came, the paper came out in, in uh, March 92, suggested that the ultra-cold collisions in the cesium clock were going to be a, a potentially a very serious problem. And so here's the frequency shift as a function of the number of collisions, the density of cesium in the, in the fountain. And you can see this uh, frequency shift. This is for atoms in all the M sub F states. Anyway, it's one way to pair the atoms. And you see this huge frequency shift. This is 12 millihertz. That's 12 millihertz out of 10 to 10 hertz, you know, something like a part in 10 to 12. Really, that is huge. The accuracy of the room temperature clocks at that point were something like a uh, part in 10 to 14, maybe 3 times 10 to minus 15 were some claims. So it was absolutely huge. And uh, we, had, we had a preliminary measurement of that by the end of September, uh, wrapped up all the systematic errors, uh, submitted the paper on January 5th, 93. So uh, it was really an extraordinary six months uh, to get to do that experiment. So uh, Carl's highlighted this, uh, this work as one of his two things when 
when, P, uh, when Steve got uh, uh, developed a longer attention span, it wasn't that long. It was still just six months here. So uh, I remember all the dates very well because uh, that was my uh, 28th birthday. And when my wife and I went out to dinner that night, she told me we were expecting. And Kristen was born uh, the day before the paper came out. So uh, it's very easy to remember all the dates. She was 914. It's uh, I was a precision measurement guy, so that's plus four and a half sigma on weight. <laughs> you know, you're going to, you're, if you, those of you who have been young parents, when you have big kids, you know, we're doing everything right. Our kid's up at the top of the curve. She's growing. You go to the pediatrician. She said, you know, you don't want her to be in the 99th percentile all her life. <laughs> so she's done just fine. She's, <laughs> she's 15 now and, and, and doing well. So here we go. So here's atoms in all the M sub F states. And so here's the spectrum. And this is the way all the clocks uh, had been running up to that point. And if you have all these extra atoms here in all these states, and only these ones give you signal, let's get rid of all those. They don't give us any signal, and they just give us collision shift. And so if you just select these atoms, put a microwave horn here, clear out the rest. And now if you have atoms in only the M equals 0 state, you get this slope. At those two lines confused a few people, including the uh, news and views writer for Nature, who saw this steeper slope and said, oops, that's bad, a steeper slope. You don't want that. Uh, thing to, the thing that's important is this point has the same signal to noise as that point, and so it has a smaller shift. What you, want, what you care about is well, you want all your atoms in the state you're going to detect. So uh, this paper did a number of things. So first, this m equals 0 seeing the collision shift, obviously, and also the, it was the first 111 launch. And all the fountains now uh, that are being built uh, do these things. And this frequency shift is still the largest systematic problem for all of the laser-cooled cesium fountain clocks that keep international atomic time today. So that was, that was really a, a, a wonderful period in our lives in, in so many different ways. Uh, going from there, what do you do? So that's a bad problem for cesium. Uh, when we went to Yale, what we did was to, to make a rubidium clock. We thought of a number of tricks on how to beat the cold collision shift. And uh, one of them is to use, try another atom. We had some tricks to pull in that other atom, but it turned out we didn't need them. Here's the shift for cesium. The shift for rubidium is 50 times smaller. Uh, 50 times smaller, the biggest problem for the clocks goes away. And in 2004, the International uh, Consultative Committee on Time and Frequency recommended that rubidium be adopted as a secondary definition of second. In 06, they recommended a number of the optical clock transitions, uh, including uh, the, the mercury that Leo talked about, and also the strontium neutral. So uh, rubidium is going to be master clock for GPS. U.S. Naval Observatory is building uh, seven of these things. The third one will be done this uh, fall. And uh, should be, uh, this should be the time that's on the GPS satellites, I think, later this year. Uh, you can pull some other tricks. You change the temperature of the cavity, and you, then you can cancel this small shift uh, by just temperature tuning the cavity. I won't explain all the physics of that, uh, but that gives you a nice way to run, run the rubidium clocks. Uh, another, so in the cesium, unfortunately, uh, you can't cancel the collision shift by tuning the temperature of the cavity. The shift's just too big. Uh, but here's another, just let me tell you a little bit of a story about how Steve's work in very diverse areas has directly impacted uh, the accuracy of, of today's clocks and future clocks. In the clocks, you have atoms in the, the two m equals zero states that are colliding, and you can vary the population of the two states. And so there's two contributions to the frequency shift that are proportional to the partial densities in each of the two states. So if you put fewer atoms up here, this term gets smaller and that term gets bigger. And so if the cross sections of those two terms uh, have opposite signs, then you can cancel it out. What we measured at one microkelvin was that they're about the same, and so you can't null the, uh, the frequency shift. So later on in 2000, uh, we thought we had nailed the, the interaction potentials, but series of measurements then didn't agree. And it was very elusive to nail down cesium. And finally, in, a, in an attempt to do BEC and sodium, uh, cesium, I'm sorry, uh, measuring a bunch of Feshbach resonances, 
nailed down finally the cesium potentials. That led to uh, a better knowledge of what was going on here. We thought that we were essentially at the zero energy limit when we were here at mic one microkelvin and that the cross-section sint changes go down to zero energy. But they do change. We're at a, essentially near a local maximum minimum here. And uh, when you go down to a tenth of a microkelvin, then uh, you can cancel that. That was just demonstrated last year. And uh, in Steve's group also, they did a beautiful demonstration of cooling atoms in a 3D lattice. And that shows you the way of how to launch atoms that cold. And so it looks like uh, with that, those tricks, cesium clocks are going to get down to something like 3 parts in 10 to 17. Um, the, let me just briefly talk about one of the things we're doing in my lab that's sort of a natural evolution of this, which is to, to really look precisely at use the atomic clock techniques to study collisions in a, with extraordinary detail. And we do a juggling atomic clock. We do that by launching two clouds of atoms right after one another. And if you have a large uh, delay between the launches, then they collide with large relative velocity. A small delay gives you a uh, small relative velocity. So you can tune the collision energy uh, in the microkelvin range. And so what happens is, in a clock, you have a coherent superposition of the two states. That's essentially a, any superposition is essentially a clock. And then we scatter that clock atom off of other atoms. And the result of the scattering is that you get this S-wave phase shift, which results in a spherically outgoing S-wave. So you get an S-wave phase shift for the three state, S-wave phase shift for the four state. And the thing that we do here that's different is to detect only the scattered atoms. So if you look at this wave function, the unscattered atoms have still the same time as they had before the clock. But the scattered atoms get two phase shifts for the two states, and so they get a huge jump in their clock's time. If we detect only the scattered atoms, then we can directly see the uh, collision scattering phase shift with atomic clock accuracy. So looking at these, we get the usual, usual Ramsey fringes. If we, with velocity slices, uh, detect only the blue atoms, then we see this large phase shift. In the previous slide, I said the frequency shift was something like millihertz. Here, it can be of order of hertz. And so this lets you really see into the core of really what's happening when the atoms scatter. You can do, we can do a wide variety of, of scattering experiments. So with that, let me conclude. And uh, as far as my salary, you know, I would have come for 20K. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's exactly, uh, exactly, exactly like uh, spinning change tuning. So uh, in the fountain, we don't have so many atoms. We don't have nearly enough atoms to make a maser. But it's an accurate clock. And so you're something like four orders of magnitude below maser threshold, but you still get enough yeah, of the cavity pull. Yeah, so the, the frequency shift that you get in a clock is the same as the mean field shift in a BC. And this is, this is really exactly the way that we got on to doing this experiment. This, so those are the questions we were thinking of in, in the mid-90s. The frequency shift of the clock or the mean field arises from the interference in the forward direction between the unscattered atoms and the scattered atoms. And so the more scattering events you have, the, this amplitude grows linearly. And so that gives you a larger and larger frequency shift proportional to density. So uh, here, if you just detect the scatter part, this in the limit of zero temperature for collisions within a single cloud of atoms in a clock, the amplitude, the population in the scattered S wave goes to zero at zero temperature. So it's the interference in the forward direction that always dominates. Thank <laughs> you.
so, so, so in a clock, you're detecting the entire atom, and the interference in the forward direction dominates. Here, we specifically don't detect that. We only detect the scattered atom. If you have multiple collisions, uh, well, we're, we're lucky here that so few, such a small percentage of the atoms collide, so essentially uh, multiple collisions are unimportant. Every atom that gets at this velocity has undergone a collision and gets those two phase shifts. Is that? Okay. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be tough to go below 1 minus 17 just because of a, a lot of different things. One of the things is just stability. To get, to get enough signal to noise to get down there, uh, just the technical signal to noise is pretty tough. So, uh, and if you, you do, you know, you see these, so we've switched to working on optical frequency clocks in my own lab, and you look at these lines of, of these slopes crossing for optical standards versus uh, microwave standards, as Leo uh, showed this morning. And so, you know, if you, you, you extrapolate out, you figure the definition of the second, the best guess in the community right now is the definition of the second is likely to change in something around 2027 if there's no more big jumps in technology. Okay. The underlying uh, reason, actually Leo gave, is that there's, uh, we have yet to define a commercial need for the next generation of clocks. <laughs>